right, well, good morning, everybody. Hope you guys are having a great Sunday. Can you believe it? September 11th is here. Boom, just like that, we're halfway through September. Two-thirds of the calendar year is over. Kids are back in school. We're here. We're here. It's going to be Thanksgiving in about five minutes. <laughs> Christmas in about ten you guys know how that goes. Well, we're starting a new sermon series today called Emotions. And a church, on behalf of the pastoral staff and the rest of the staff, we want you to know that we love you guys. We love you guys, and thank you for allowing us to lead you to the cross of Christ each and every week. So I'm wondering, how y'all doing? No, like really. How are you doing? When people ask me that question nowadays... Honestly, it's never been more complicated in my entire life to answer that. Seriously, like, here's the deal. When I'm asked that question, I kind of, like, hesitate a little bit. Like, should I tell you the truth on how I really feel? Or should I tell you how I'm doing based upon all the stuff that's going on in the world? How you doing? Complicated question this side of the pandemic, isn't it? I saw a post on Facebook recently that said, what one word best describes your emotional state? And then in parentheses it said, no cuss words. So how about you, how you doing? What's one word that would describe your emotional state right now? No cuss words, okay? I asked some of my friends that question and one guy said, numb. Okay, he just feels kinda numb. A couple of people uh, said that they feel angry uh, another friend says he was irritated. A couple of more people said anxious or afraid. But for me, if I was going to be transparent with you, and I always am, the one word that I would give is uncertain. Everything just feels uncertain to me. Like even in the small things. Remember it used to be just so easy to give up somebody a handshake? Nowadays we're kind of uncertain, right? It's like, I'm kind of measuring every one of you out every week when I'm coming around saying hi. Like, do I give the handshake? Am I doing the fist bump thing? Is it the elbow? Some of you are just like, Wayne, big old hug. I'm wondering, do I still need to social distance a little bit? So I'm still a little uncertain in the small things. But then there's the big things, right? The economic uncertainties. On YouTube, you can see every wannabe economist tell you of how close we are to economic doom and gloom. The world economy is about to end. It's going to be worse than 1929 and 2008 combined. And then we have, have all the racial and social tensions in the world, the Supreme Court decisions, the bitterness towards police officers, all the political divisions, and all the mudslinging that you see on the news. All of these things just add to this feeling that the future is a little bit uncertain. And when you talk to people, you realize that everybody's emotional. So does that describe you? If you're watching online, type on the platform, y'all are crazy. <laughs> so Pastor Randy and I got to thinking a few months ago about what we needed to preach on in September. And so we felt it'd be good to dive into this theme of emotions and we want to focus on how to deal with what you feel. And we just don't want to talk about emotions, but instead we want to talk about them from a Bible-centered perspective. Folks, God has given us our emotions, and learning to control them and have the right perspective is key to living a God-honoring life. So we know that our feelings, they are unreliable at times. In fact, many times when we depend on our emotions as our compass for life, they often lead us in the wrong direction. And when that happens, it makes us a slave to them. So simply put, we either learn to control our emotions or they will control us. And as we're talking today, we realize that we have gone through and to some extent, we're still kind of in it, the worst pandemic in the last 100 years on earth. COVID has caused all kinds of fear worldwide. We've experienced fear in our families, in our churches, our schools, our jobs, shopping centers, movie theaters, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And all these emotions that people have had, 
You've experienced it. It's been polarizing to say the least. People do not like fear. In fact, LifeWay Christian Resources put out an article that said 41% of Americans want to seek to avoid the emotion of fear more than any other emotions. That same survey said that 46% of Americans desire to completely eradicate fear and anxiety from their life, if at all possible. So a few minutes ago, I asked you, how are you doing? If you answer that yourself by saying, well, I'm kind of afraid of, and you fill in the blank there, I get it. Fear is something that we all experience. You might answer that with, well, I'm afraid that my business might shut down. You might be saying, well, I'm fearful that I might pick up the COVID virus from someone. You might say, I don't know what's going to happen in my neighborhood because of all the transition that's going on. You might say the stock market might take a dive and I'm fearful of it. My house might lose its equity. My loved one might pass on into eternity. I might get a doctor's report that's not very, shall we say, positive. Yeah, we all have various fears. So I want you to turn with me in your Bible to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's see what God has to say today about fear. We're going to be looking at verse 7 in just a second. So while you're finding that, let me give you a little context here. 2 Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in a dungeon in Rome. And he's writing to his son in the faith, his beloved friend Timothy. Timothy has uh, got some fear going on about the Roman government in his new pastoral assignment in Ephesus. So here's Timothy. He knows that his mentor Paul is about to get beheaded in Rome, and he was wondering if possibly he might be next. And so Paul writes to Timothy. We're in chapter 1, verse 7. Here's what it says. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power love, and sound judgment. So the word fear here, it speaks of like this impending stress. It could mean like cowardice or misfortune that would lead to impending moral failure as well. But this is not what God has given us, right? He's not given us an apprehensive spirit. Instead, he's given us a spirit of power, of love, and of sound judgment. Some translations will use the term self-control there. Now think about that, power, power, power to endure anything that comes at you spiritually. Jesus already conquered the enemy, right? He's given you the same victory. Love, an unexplainable ability to unconditionally love yourself and other people. That's totally a gift from God and God alone. Sound judgment. Right? God has given us the ability to allow our thoughts to be in a status of control. Now, you may be in a place where you feel like life is completely a mess this morning, and you're really struggling with some pain-filled emotions, and I want you to know that there is hope for you in the Lord Jesus Christ, because his word never, ever, ever fails. You may be experiencing anger. You might be experiencing sadness, hurt, or even fear itself. And next week, Pastor Randy's going to teach us about how to deal with anger. And what's interesting about anger is anger looks to the past. When we get angry, right, we look to something that has already transpired. But fear, fear looks to the future. And if we don't deal with fear properly, things will more than likely repeat themselves. And then it's like all of a sudden, here we go again. We don't like that. So no matter what you're experiencing, God has a plan for your life and for my life. To live life abundantly. Jesus came so that we could live the abundant life. No matter what's happened in the past or what's going to happen in the future, God wants you and I in the here and now to live the abundant life. One day at a time, every single day. And that place right there, family, is filled with joy, it's filled with peace, it's filled with trust, and it's filled with hope. So today as we learn how to deal with what we feel about fear, I want you to know that God wants us to take a deep swim in his pool of his word. 2 Corinthians 10 says that by his power, we demolish strongholds. 
And fear may have a stronghold in your life. And what you need is a covering of God's word to help you to begin to demolish it. Because see, the more of God's word that you input into your life, the more your faith will increase. And when we increase in faith, fear diminishes. The Bible says that faith comes from hearing the word of God. Faith is the antidote to fear. Yeah, it's a process. It's, gonna, it's not going to happen overnight. But one day at a time, every single day, you put God's word in, you will increase in faith. So look on the screens. Look on your notes. Let's see what God says about these things to help your soul get some peace today. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10 says this. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Jesus said in the red letters in the New Testament in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. No, instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. In the book of 1 John chapter 4, it says, There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. And the psalmist writes in chapter 56, verse 3, it says, When I am afraid, I will what, church? Trust in you. Psychologists have a tool that they use to explain stress overload to their patients called the emotional cup. In the most concise way that I can explain it, it's this idea that we all have an emotional cup that's unique to ourselves. And we have the ability to kind of only hold a certain amount of emotional energy. And as things in life happen that produce these unhelpful emotions inside of us, the result is our cup fills up. And when our cup is full and we experience more negative emotions, it overflows and we have this idea called called spillage. And typically when this happens, we more than likely feel like life has just beat us down. And these are those times when you feel things like impatience and depression and loss of energy and compulsive behaviors, insecurity, and there's others. And if we experience multiple events in a single day that produce all of these unhelpful emotions, our cup is going to feel really, really fast. And you can see where this all goes. It's going to end up, you're going to have a real rough day real fast. And so if you've ever seen a counselor for some help, maybe they might have used this tool to help show you how emotions work and what the antidotes are for each and every one to help you get through your negative negative time. But what's interesting to me when I read about this is that a lot of these negative emotions, they're kind of connected to one another. For example, hurt is connected to sadness. Sadness is connected to anger. Anger is connected to fear. Fear is connected to guilt. Guilt's connected to condemnation. And counselors will tell you that most of these emotions need to be dealt with in a very specific order in order to get you to that positive destination that you desire. So today as we're learning to deal with fear, we have to know that when we experience fear in life, if we don't deal with it correctly, the end result can be a real mess potentially. And typically... Fear shows itself in a myriad of behavioral problems. Some examples. Some people might withdraw from life and the people that they have relationships with. They might just go isolate for long periods of time. You ever known somebody to do that? Other people might put up a facade and ignore things and just pretend that the problem's just gonna go away if they just stay right here. Some people try to deal with fear by trying to be perfect If I just go all out, cross all the T's, dot all the I's, I'm not going to get hurt. Other people try to control things or try to control other people by being in a place of authority. You know somebody like that? Still other people, they self-medicate, try to run from life's problems, try to run from their fear by getting into addictive behaviors and looking for a way to escape and go numb. Some people try to resolve 
by just escaping and working long hours. The list goes on and on. There's many more. But all of these happen because of people's emotional cups are overflowing. Now, for us as Christians, if we don't learn to deal with these emotions in a correct way through a Bible perspective, we're in for a really rough ride. So if we're going to begin to have victory over fear in our life and demolish the stronghold in the name of Jesus, we have to go to the foundations of fear, to the grassroots, to the very beginning. And demolishing fear begins with the knowledge about its own structure. There are three dimensions that I want to let you know about the emotion of fear. So the first is this, the mental dimension. The mental dimension of fear. This is what's happening in our mind. So let's call fear what it is. Fear is a liar. It always exaggerates the truth. It always misrepresents. In 2016, Christian music artist Zach Williams wrote a song called Fear is a Liar. The chorus of that song says, fear will take your breath. It'll stop you in your steps. It'll rob your rest. It will steal your happiness. The truth about fear is fear begins in our mind, and then it moves to the second dimension, which is our heart. It travels down to to the deep parts of our spirit. This is where the well of our emotions and our feelings reside. And then fear progresses to the outside, to the third dimension, which is located in our choices. And we can look back in the wake of our life, and we can see through some of the choices that we've made if fear was present or not. It's kind of truthful, very revealing. So if we're going to deal properly with fear, we've got to keep those three dimensions in focus every single time we're facing it. So how do we deal with fear? What do we do? Well, number one in your outline. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take fear captive by God's truth. So here in our minds, in the mental battle, we want to take fear captive by God's truth. Let's put fear in jail, if you will, okay? So no longer can we afford to let fear continue to just run rampant in our minds without being checked. Checked by what? God's word. By the truth of what's in it. Notice what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will, what church? It will set you free. We've already said fear is a liar. And many times, the fear that we experience is based on a lie to begin with. When we can see the truth in a given situation, when our emotions just need to play catch up to truth. And God says when, the, when our emotions and truth align, it sets us free. Here's some lies you may have been hearing over the last couple of years, and I just believe they're from the pit of hell myself. One of the ones that you've heard is, everything's out of control. The world is falling apart, right? The wheels are going off the wagon. Lie. It's contradictory to truth. Truth says, Ephesians 1.11, that God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Period. None of these issues that are happening across the globe are causing God to have any panic at all. They're causing people to have panic but not the Lord. And in that same section of Scripture in the book of Ephesians, verse 13 writes, that when you believed in Christ, you were marked with a seal, and you are secure in the promise of the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing you redemption as God's chosen possession. That's truth. All things are working together for God's purposes, family. Everything. The devil is a liar. Fear is a liar. God's word is truth. Here's another lie that you'll hear. The future is filled with hopelessness. This idea of fatalism, right? The future is just bad. This is just crazy. It's a lie. Family, the truth is that the future is filled with hope. For those who know Christ, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 that what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. 
Titus 2.13 says that we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Family, the future is full of hope. And another lie that fear tries to speak into our lives is that life is just too complicated. It's just over our heads. Here's what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1. He raised Christ from the dead and seated him on his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything. So here's the truth, and this is worth coming to church today for. What is over your head is under the feet of Jesus. Jesus is Lord over all things. That is the truth of God's word, and that is what we can hope in. You see on the screen behind me, Romans chapter 8, verse 6. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. And this is our prayerful practice, family. The mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is death. Life and peace is what God is calling you to. So it all starts in our minds, the battle of the emotions. No matter what emotion it is, it's won or lost in your mind. That's the mental dimension. We take fear captive by God's truth. His truth is found in his word. So that means we need to input God's word into our lives. Family, hear me. You cannot get victory over fear in your life without this component. It's impossible. So let me encourage you. Begin to read the word of God regularly if you have not already begun doing so. Now, there are a ton of tools available to you. There's some great Bible apps that you can download to your phone or to your tablet. I use the Olive Tree one. It's great. There's the version app that a lot of you have. Maybe you just prefer a handheld physical Bible. Awesome. If you don't own one, we'll give you one. But whatever it takes, get God's word into your soul. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So take fear captive by God's truth today. There's no victory without it. So the second thing we're going to do is, number two, we're going to drive out fear by God's perfect love. This is the emotional component. And the first part of 1 John chapter 4, we read this a little bit ago in verse 18, says that there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love drives out fear. I love that. Why? Because the whole context of 1 John chapter 4 is that God loved us first. Just because it's who he is. Not that anything that we did to deserve it. He just is love. In fact, that very section of scripture says that God is love. It's his perfect nature. His love is perfect, and he drives out fear. So in his perfect love, he sent Jesus to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins when we were not worthy of his love, and we were stained in our sin. And sending Jesus, by the way, is the greatest gift that mankind has ever received. So when we receive Christ into our lives, we receive the power of the Holy Spirit. His power is what moves us to give love horizontally to other people. That's God working in you. And when we love other people and we pray for them and we give to meet their needs, God does a wondrous work inside of us and inside of the person that we're loving on. He drives out fear in both people. So your husband's having a bad day, comes home from work. What do you do? Listen to him pray over him. Your best friend's having marital problems. What do you do? Listen to them. Pray over them. Offer to help them in whatever way you can. Your sister, your coworker, your friend, whatever it is, going through some fear, what do you do? You bless them 
by listening to them and you offer to pray over them. People who are experiencing fear, what they don't need is they don't need facts, they don't need logic, they don't need reason. They don't need criticism, they don't need complaints, neglect, or pep talks. They just need love. Agape love from you. The best tool you have in helping a friend or a loved one is to show them compassion. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. Your loved one needs God's perfect love with you as the vessel to drive out fear emotionally. You can do that by having a, a reassuring presence or you know, showing perfect love that just say, hey, I care about you. You know, It's often said people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You could show perfect love by offering to help somebody in the future. Hey, Ethel, if you ever need anything, call me. You know, one of those types of things. Be there for them when they call you. Take fear captive by God's truth. Drive out fear by showing God's perfect love to the people in your life. And the third thing we'll do is this. We'll become free from fear by faith in God. In our daily living, in our choices, in how we think, we become free from fear by increasing faith and believing in God's word. Family, fear and faith cannot coexist in the same space. You're either fearful without faith or you're faithful without fear. You know, Pastor Randy actually said this a year ago today in the Take Back Your Life sermon series. Don't be fearful. Don't be fearful. Trust God. Grow your faith. Anytime you are experiencing fear, your faith is absent. When your faith is present, fear is diminished. That's the way that it is. So I want you to turn in your Bible to the book of Mark chapter 4 with me. Let me set this up. Jesus and his disciples are getting in the boat. They're going to cross the lake to the other side, and there's this raging storm going on. Jesus has taken a nap. The disciples are in a panic, fearfully believing that they are about to die. So they go, wake up, Jesus. Jesus, get up, get up, get up, get up, right? And he gets up. He yawns a little bit. Uh, does some little stretches. <clears throat> Meanwhile, there's a storm going out. Stands up, walks to the front of the boat, puts his hand out, and he just says, be quiet. And the storm calmed down in one nanosecond. Jesus turns to his disciples, and in verse 40, we see this. So then he said to them, why are you guys still so afraid? Do you still have no faith? So simply put, here's what Christ is implying here. If you guys have genuine faith in God, that should eliminate all of your fear. Because here's Jesus' rationale. Jesus told his disciples that they were going to get in the boat, they were going to cross the lake and get to the other side. They should have known that he was Lord and that he was the Messiah, connected to God in a very special way, and that they should have taken him at his word that they were going to get to the other side of the lake safely. He's not going to lie to them. But the storm came, the wind and the waves, they were all howling, and they did not trust in Jesus. And so that's why Jesus says here in this verse, why are you afraid? As if to say, hey guys, the weather is subject to me. Relax, I got this. Trust me, we will get to the other side of the lake safely. And so this story here it really helps us to think about the power of God and his faithfulness to us. The Lord keeps his promise. Friends, God says he's going to do something. He's going to do it no matter what. God has never, ever, ever broken one single promise, and he's not about to start right here in September of 2022. But in our free will, God gives us choice to believe him or not. We can choose to have faith in his word. We can choose not to have faith in his word. And so it begs the question, will you choose to look forward into the future through the lens of faith or through the lens of fear? 
because faith and fear are both future-oriented. Tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, what lens are you looking through? Hebrews 11.1 says, now that faith is the reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what is not seen. We can totally become free of fear by putting our faith and our trust in Jesus. Let me give you some verses that communicate God's promise to us. Hebrews 13.5, God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Is there anybody in this room that needed that promise from God today? He'll never leave you. Philippians 4, verse 6. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. Your heavenly Father knows what you need. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Notice it doesn't say, and some of these things. No, no. Christ says, all of these things will be provided for you. You see, family, we really want you to grasp this concept this morning is that Jesus is the object of your faith. He is the anchor and perfecter of our faith. He sits at the right hand of God Almighty. So let me encourage you today to maximize faith and minimize fear by looking to Jesus. Fix your eyes on him and him alone. Whatever you're feeling fear about, it's lying to you. Whatever you have some anxiety about in your life, I just want you to know that Jesus understands how you feel. You and I, we're a lot like the disciples in the boat. Jesus understands where you're at this morning, and he's still calling you to trust him. He's calling you to take a little bit of a leap of faith and allow him to help you become free of fear. So that's where it's really at today. The choice is yours to believe him or not to believe him. Will you trust him or not? You'll be amazed at how he comes through when you actually take a leap of faith. You're sitting amongst people who have experienced that blessing. So let me say it to you one more time today. If we're going to claim victory over fear, we have to do three things. Number one, we have to take fear captive by the truth of God's word. Let's input God's word into our life it's trustworthy. The second thing is we have to drive out fear with perfect love. God loves us because he wants to. It's not based upon anything that we've done or haven't done. It's because love is who God is and he wants us to love others. That should bring some emotional security to you. And lastly, we become free from fear by maximizing our faith in God. So in our choices, Let's choose to trust him and obey him. Whenever God says do X and your mind is telling you do Y, do not do this. Do this. Why? Because it will honor God, he will bless you for your obedience, and you will grow in faith. Family, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit lives in the life of every believer. He knows each one of us actually better than we know ourselves. So whatever you're feeling fear about, I want you to know that help is on the way. Jesus loves you. He cares about you. He knows how you feel, and he's still calling you to trust him. So will you trust him today? Will you surrender your fear? Surrender it to him. Will you step out in faith this morning? I'm going to invite you to stand. Let's pray this morning together. <clears throat> Pray with me, congregation. Father, we stand here today. We believe in Jesus. Lord, we believe that there is healing power in the name of Christ. And Father, that same power that raised Christ from the dead, from your own hand, is upon us right now for who believe in him. God, there's some people in this room that are really struggling. Some are listening online. We're struggling with some fear. 
It's no surprise to you, but Lord, for whatever reason, it's got a stronghold in their life. And they just can't seem to break free. So God, we are calling upon you today to do a miraculous work from heaven. God, I'm asking you to reach out and touch the life of everybody in this room, everybody that's watching us online, Lord, that you will do an amazing work in their life. God, I pray for everybody who's struggling with fear, Lord, that you would give them a peace that passes all understanding. To know that you are near and that you are present in whatever distress they have. God, I pray that you help each one of us to increase our faith by looking to your son as the anchor and pillar of our faith. God, we place our trust in you today. So as we're here in this place this morning, God, may we see you for who you are, and let's worship you in spirit and truth today. And it's your name that we pray. Amen.